without fear, there is no courage or bravery. To be courageous or brave, you have to be having gone through the fear. So it, it, I'm not saying it really ever quite goes away, but you learn slowly but surely hanging on and, and through focus and will to work through it. Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I wanna welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to Manage Vets Consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Bend. My name is Debbie Boone, and I am your host today, and I'm proud to introduce my friend, uh, Marilee Malloy. Now, Marilee and I met on LinkedIn, oddly enough, and she was managing a large specialty hospital in Seattle, and I happened to be on a trip out there and just reached out and said, hey, why don't we connect? And we had lunch, and we've been friends ever since. So I'm going to give you her complete bio in the show notes, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, all the bends in the road, because she's certainly had many. So Marilee, welcome today, and thank you for taking your time to be on the bend with us. Thank you so much. I have enjoyed our friendship and, and collegiality and, and uh, all of your wonderful accomplishments over the last few years. So it's just a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for doing such a wonderful job on my logo. Mary Lee designed my logo after me changing my mind like 40 times. And she was so patient and so wonderful. And I absolutely adore my logo and everything that she built for me. So thank you uh, for that. But let's talk a little bit about how you got from, I mean, you have shown horses, you've shown dogs, you manage a veterinary hospital. You have had so many bends in your row. So tell me a little bit about your origin story. Well, wow. Well, you know, I'm kind of an old lady, you know, grandma here. But uh, I, I, one of the things I, I tell people now as I've gone back into the, the uh, veterinary management with my uh, training is um, if President Biden can do it and Pelosi can do it, then I can do it. <laughs> so there we go. So yes, I've had a very long career. I actually started out um, right after college and, and went back to work after I had a, a couple of children. Um, I started out in the, the real estate industry, but in real estate development. And I went on to become a certified escrow officer in California and ran some escrow companies. So that gave me um, a financial background and, and numbers and that kind of thing, which I love, really, which I never thought I would. Um, you know, in, in school, I was terrible at math. And the only F I ever got in my whole life was in accounting. So it doesn't, it didn't make any sense to me at all that I ended up in escrow. But it, it's the thing that made sense sense to me. When it finally clicked, it all made sense. So anyway, I digress a little bit. So yeah, um, I, I've done a, a lot of things. And um, because we're, we're talking about a long career, um, I'd like to just kind of maybe go back and focus on how I actually got started in the, in, in veterinary uh, field and management. Um, I had been managing and we had moved to Washington State uh, back in uh, the early 90s. And um, I was actually training dogs um, in the field with a, a veterinarian who had a small one veterinarian practice and she needed support and help and some consulting. And so I worked with her for close to a year. Um, it eventually, what eventually came of that work was um, she really didn't want to be practicing medicine. She wanted to be training dogs. 
And she ended up actually letting the practice go, selling it, and going on to train dogs with her training partner, uh, field trialing and things like that. So it was a question of her helping her to really, I think, get clear and follow her passion. And then following that, um, I was at that point, I was uh, raising and training golden retrievers. And one of my puppies went to a, my veterinarian. And my veterinarian at that time was the managing partner, five partner practice in Snohomish, Washington. And they, uh, they had five partners, but it was also a small animal and, you know, dairy cattle and horses. So it, it kind of did the whole spectrum. And um, so he knew of my background a little bit and they needed a new manager. And he approached me and said, how would you like to be our new practice manager? And I said, oh, that sounds really good. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I went in and the first thing I said was, let me start at the bottom. I went down and I worked for two weeks and learned how to clean the kennels and learn the procedures. And I worked my th way through each of the departments. And of course my, my weakest area was I'm not a technician. And so, um, you know, I got to really kind of really dig in on that and, and um, so appreciate it, so appreciate it. Uh, so I was actually with them for close to five years. And toward about, I think about four and a half years in, the, uh, we were approached by a, uh, at that time, which was fairly new for veterinary corporations purchasing practices and merging. That was back in uh, 1999, I think it was. Yeah, 99. And so um, we actually ended up taking their offer. Uh, and uh, my, the managing partner, my boss, uh, went on to be the, the medical director for the corporation. And they asked me to come in as regional manager and help them not only kind of manage a couple of the hospitals in the area, but also uh, be part of the team that spoke with, um, you know, possible hospitals to bring into the, into the corporation. Um, so that looked like it was going to be really exciting and interesting for me. Well, what happened was by three months in, I realized that I didn't want to work for these people. <laughs> they weren't keeping their promises. And so I left. And about a year later, my former boss and the medical director, who was by then gray, and I was afraid he was going to have a heart attack, he left. And he went on to be uh, the, uh, the medical and hospital director over at Washington State uh, Veterinary School. And he just recently left there. So that's that was my, my introduction into veterinary medicine. Um, I left that and um, yeah. And so I kind of moved along through the years, but I'll let you ask another question. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so there's where you got started. At, and and I, you were managing, especially hospital when we met and had lunch. And, um, and like I said, I met your two wiener dogs because um, you did have the dachshunds at that time. They came to lunch with us. So, Marilee, tell us how life threw you, maybe your first curveball. Um, are you talking about life, Deb, or are you talking about in my business professional life? It, actually, you know, it could be either one. I, I think the biggest curveball um, that you've faced and overcome is always interesting for people to, um, to get some perspective on how to do that for themselves. Well, the biggest curveball was um, being on vacation with my husband in Mexico and being shot in the chest and having it miss my aorta by a quarter of an inch and almost dying in Mexico in a little tiny town. So, but oh. that's my, that's really my story of, of um, God, if you will, because I am a very um, spiritual, spiritually minded and inclined person. And so if, at that point, um, everything came together. It, this, there was no hospital where we were. There was a Red Cross station. And yet staying in the uh, hotel where the uh, accident happened, it was, it was not an accident. A guy went crazy with a gun and shot me and uh, several other people. But staying in that hotel was an aide to the president of Mexico and a surgeon from Canada. Oh, my goodness. 
and he, they he helped stabilize me and the Mexican government flew in a plane onto a dirt airstrip and airlifted me out, um, stabilized me for a couple of weeks and then sent me back to the States where I had surgery and fully recovered. But it was, um, yeah, that was, uh, so that's mm -hmm. probably the most traumatic, you know, event in my life. Yeah. Um, you know, how, how I uh, maybe, honestly, uh, probably the biggest, the biggest issue that I overcame in my life. And honestly, I think I'm still dealing with it. I thought it was over with, but it, um, in 2001, I made the, 2001, 2000 maybe, I made the decision to end a 16 year marriage that was becoming more and more toxic. And I was not liking who I was. I was getting sick. And I made the decision to leave. And so I basically walked away from everything. I, I left the house that I had put money and time into. And I had to stop raising dogs. Um, my last litter of golden puppies, which I was pretty well known. So I was able to take that money. And I took a job in California. It was an interim job, actually executive director for the Peruvian um, National Peruvian Horse Club. And so, yeah, that was huge. Um, it, um, I, my husband finally came out a year later after I left him. So that was, it was, it all, it all made sense. You know, I kept knowing and knowing, but it, it just wasn't working. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've had to learn to really forgive him for that and let go of that, which pretty much I have. I mean, it took me eight years to even get to the point where I could even think about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So it was, that's, that's probably my biggest life lesson, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I think that's um, certainly two big hurdles. I, I want to get back to the, to the first one, because <clears throat> during this year, during the pandemic, I think one of the the challenges, especially for a lot of younger people, has been fear and resilience and such a almost a crippling fear. But now you, truthfully, you've been the victim of a mass shooting. I mean, this is we we think that mass shootings are just kind of now they're happening, but they're they're historically there've been mass shootings as long as there've been recordings of things. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you dealt with that emotionally and how you overcame the fear to move forward into life without, you know, just being afraid that every time you went anywhere that somebody was going to come out of the woodwork with a gun. You know, that's interesting. Um, I, I think still to this day, I mean, I, and I will go back and answer that, but even to this day, I am aware when I go into a restaurant or anywhere of where I sit, I always sit where I can face out and look at people. Um, I had an, an intuition before he actually stood up to shoot me that something was wrong. And I, I remember saying to my husband, he was at a, a restaurant table away from us. I don't remember how many feet, but, you know, just across the room, really. And I remember saying to my husband, he, he, this, this guy's really kind of strange, you know. So, yeah. So, I think, you know, talking about the PSD and the, the worries and, you know, we're watching the violence that happens in the world. What helped me was number one, I, um, and I was treated, oh my goodness, the, the, the Mexican people, the, the patients in the hospital, totally different than here. I mean, patients have families that come and sit with them and stay with them. And, and um, I, I was just, I was treated so lovingly and kindly. Um, but I was able to come home and I was, I was able to come home with a lot of support, um, from my husband and my, my children and my boss who, um, had worked for a former state Senator. He was the top attorney in, in a very large real estate development corporation. And they did, they really watched out for me. So I was, um, not only was I physically taken care of by the surgery, but I was given time to heal. 
Um, I think that I, I, if I remember right, I had, took about three months off and then um, they offered me the position because I had been doing a lot of legal work with him and huge um, projects, uh, you know, uh, sh shopping centers and things like that. So they offered me the position real close to home um, as an escrow officer. And that's really, I'd had other experience before that and before I went to them, but that really kind of got that career started. And they supported me a lot through that. So I had, I had my home. I had, you know, two children at home. I had the horses. I had my husband. So I kept busy, you know, mm -hmm. I, as I tell people, you know, you just pull up your big girl pants and you keep on going. Not to deny what happened or the feelings, but, you know, you, I think you just continually work on them. At the same time, I was also, I had a lot of support from my spiritual community from my church and so that whole combination of of faith and 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 courage and something that i heard a couple of weeks ago which i did want to share which was without fear there is no courage or bravery to be courageous or brave you have to be having gone through the fear so it, it I'm not saying it really ever quite goes away, but you learn slowly but surely hanging on and and through focus and will to work through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I have I have a sign here on my desk that has been on my desk for probably close to 22 years now, and it says "Courage is fear that has said its prayers." love it you and I love we're so much alive uh -huh. yes <laughs> yes and I, I found it when I was diagnosed with breast cancer I was 46 years old and I printed it out just a you know, regular inkjet printer printed it out and folded it up and I put it on my desk and it stayed on my desk when I worked at the first hospital and it went with me to the second hospital and it's been with me ever since I've been doing my consulting business and it sits right here on the glass under my desk and I can glance at it any time. But I, I do believe that's true. And I think that maybe some of the great fear that a lot of people have during this pandemic is maybe they don't have deep faith or maybe they don't have that, you know, that faith support group. And of course, you and I know it, we're not talking about organized religion because that's not necessarily supportive uh, at, at all times but we're talking about you know true what I would call true Christianity which is love one another you know yeah, yeah that's it yeah. that's what it is you know it's, yeah. it's, it's love and respect and 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 justice and and just above all love you know mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's sometimes that's really tough you know yes. it's very tough to do um, it's the work of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, you, you asked me something about the young people and it, it, it kind of brought this to mind. So when COVID hit, um, I had a couple of what I call bread and butter clients and I wasn't wanting to work, you know, 60 hours a week, like I was used to for most of my life, 50, 60 hours to, that's just my personality. You know, I just dig right in. And I lost them. So I lost basically all my income. And last February, of course, COVID kind of really hit us the middle of March. Well, last February, on the 19th, my father passed away, my beloved father. And a week later, my sister passed away. So, phew. I'm still choking up. You know, it was like I was dealing with grief and then COVID hit and I was dealing with fear. Um, so I, I allowed myself a couple of weeks to just really, you know, just really cry and yeah. So then I decided, okay, well, what am I gonna do? I knew I needed to do something. So I thought, I tried a couple of things, honestly, I, I um, I didn't really have the money to do any marketing. 
And I hadn't done any marketing because I really stayed boutique and concentrated on these clients and, you know, people like you that came occasionally and, and Rensselaer. Um, so what I did was I thought, well, let me try this. And I won't mention what it was, but it was in the pet industry. Let me try this. So I, I had a lot of time creating that, a lot of fun creating it. And then I realized that I can't make this grow because this requires me to go out and sell or hire salespeople in New Mexico to go out and sell. It's COVID. I can't, you know, I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. It didn't go, it didn't go away. So um, then I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll just focus on, you know, marketing to ministries and things. And I did some work there with some of the churches and things like that, which I love. I love to support the organizations that, that are close to my heart. And basically that is veterinary medicine, healthcare, medical practices, physicians, and nonprofits. And of course, churches fall within that. So I've kind of just narrowed that down. Well, that wasn't quite working for me and I didn't know why and I couldn't figure it out. So I just went, you know, I did a lot of discernment work and um, realized that what I got the most enjoyment out of in my years in veterinary medicine, I'd say from 2006 through 2000, well, I was left veterinary medicine in 2013, but I also continued on with some um, other pet businesses supporting them in this way. And I realized that what I really loved doing was the training and the teaching with the system that had that I'd taken up to summit and had been so successful that I'd taken into the de into the desert uh, as a regional manager and bringing together these this management training. So I thought, well, I think that's what I need to do. And I went, oh no, no, no. But so there we are. I I actually just got everything pretty much together and launched it this week. So to me, that's the, the perseverance and going in the direction. I, I believe that this is the direction that I'm supposed to take for the rest of my life. And I don't believe I'll ever stop the work because that's just, I wouldn't know what to do. You know, my kids are growing. They're, they're living in Hawaii. They're, they're great parents. You know, the grandkids are doing well. So it's just me now. And um, that, that's okay. Yep. Yep. So merely, obviously, um, I want and I want to talk about your new venture. But looking back over your career, um, what do you think was your biggest mistake? But and then what was the takeaway from that? Yeah, you know, I I, I thought about that. The biggest mistake. Hmm. That's a hard one, Debbie, because sometimes I really don't think there's mistakes that that something happens and we really learn from it. Um, I guess I'd have to say I, I've been very fortunate to work with pretty much really wonderful people. The biggest mistake would be that I didn't realize when the merger occurred in Washington that I didn't, I wasn't able to see that all these guys were in it for was some money mm -hmm. and to make a quick buck and to pull together some practices and make some shabby promises and then sell their company off. So I didn't pick that up. Mm -hmm. But I but it took me three months and that's a pretty quick time to get yeah, that, to get that, out. That's it fast was. enough to escape, I think. It was, yeah, it I was. Think. And then what was really interesting, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? Because I knew I wanted to go to California. And while I was looking for a job, I took a, a, a temporary position as the volunteer coordinator for Deaconess Children's Services, which is run... Um, it, it's like an adoption type family service in Washington and they didn't they needed help to get their huge event put together for Christmas and so I was able to walk out of that yucky situation into serving children and families and this loving wonderful environment even though I got paid like ten dollars an hour I think. <laughs> it was like okay you know yeah it was yeah. like okay um I that and that's what really opened my heart up to working with nonprofits and stuff. You know. Yeah. Well, that's probably a 
a mental and physical break from the toxicity of where you were. And, and I know what corporation you were talking about too. So we won't mention okay. it. Oh dear. Yeah. I don't care. They're, they're not around anymore. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, there, you know, there's, there's corporates that do a really wonderful job yeah. coming in and working with the veterinarians that they buy the veterinary hospitals they buy and there's other ones who I think create more toxicity than was there previously. And, and it's really is nothing more than investment bankers trying to churn uh, yeah. for money. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's it. So I'd really try to help my clients. I do a lot of work with clients who are strategically planning to sell and uh, got kind of prepping them for that. But I also help them pick like, don't do this, do do this. And, you know, people that I know within these groups that I know are good, honest people that will truly take care of the teams and, and take care of the, the practice too. Like, I mean, a lot of these practices are like children to the owners. They, oh. they put their life work into it and they really don't want the reputation that they built every year is destroyed. And, and I think that's uh, certainly valuable to acknowledge when you're looking for somebody to buy you. Well, and I got, the, the flip side of that is I got to experience a really, um, a really good experience after I, um, after I left California and ended up back in New Mexico and managing um, and bringing the new agreements to uh, a medical practice. And I was with them for almost five years. And then I got recruited and I accepted because it just was so exciting by pet doctors, um, pet DRX to go to the Southern California area and help them merge some practices. And, and they had, these were practices they bought and, but they, they did, they just did it right. You know, they were wonderful to work with. They ended up actually selling out to VCA two and a half years later, but I, I got to experience the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I got to be part of creating that experience. And that was, you know, that was really life affirming for me. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about your new project now. Do you mind sharing your age? Because I think this is an important factor of, of reinventing yourself. Okay. So as I said, President Biden and Nancy Pelosi and I are all the same age. <laughs> there you go. Actually, I'm going to celebrate my 80th birthday in October. And I just tell people that I'm 80 going on 50 because that's where I'm at. You know, I'm just, that's where I'm at. Yeah. And uh, I inherited my mom's good skin and, and I thank her for that. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, my, my mother-in-law taught me when I was really young because I'd been married <clears throat> 42 years and my husband and I dated five years before that. So we've been together since we were in high school. But my mother-in-law had beautiful skin and she didn't, she avoided the sun and she used uh, Pond's cold cream and oil of Olay <laughs> all the time. And I, I mean, I, she just, really taught me to avoid the sun. And I think that's, uh, uh, my mother is a golfer. So my mom was out all the time in the sun. And so uh, hopefully that I will age as well as you have Marilee because you look beautiful. Um, but tell us about your new project because you, we had a conversation the other day and I said, this is really interesting. And uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the new agreement. So let's just kind of start there and talk about that and, and the idea behind it and then what you're doing with it. Thanks. Well, the new agreements in the workplace or the new agreements for leaders as well is, is, um, was developed by David Dibble, who um, developed the program after uh, he was a, a very successful CEO. He was also worked for seven years with Don Miguel Ruiz, who is, of course, the author of the Four Agreements, which is a very famous book. So what David did is he was a he he worked with systems leaders um, that work with systems based management and systems based tools. So what David did is he combined at the beginning of this uh, back when I was studying with him, I studied, I went to California every month for six months from New Mexico to study with him and this group um, to become certified as a trainer. And so what it is, it's a combination of helping uh, owners, business leaders learn to become 
conscious leaders or servant leaders that I use that term uh, in, you know, it doesn't matter, conscious mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever feels good to you. So the conscious leadership model is, and the servant leadership model has grown in great popularity and is taught at Stanford, which is one of my favorite places to, to look at all their information. And the systems-based model actually came out of, oh my gosh, I just lost his name. Um, anyway, right after World War II, he went to Japan and he helped the Japanese restructure using systems-based tools. And what happens with, when you combine these two, you have leaders who are moving away from that old top-down model that we all learned as we were starting out in management and it's still used for the majority today, okay? Mm -hmm. but, but servant leadership is basically taking and recognizing that the people that are doing the work, whatever it is, in whatever team, in whatever way they're doing it, are the ones that know what's wrong. They know what the problems are. And so pulling them in into this process allows them to work with top line leaders to identify and resolve the issues instead of somebody saying, we'll do it this way, or let's try this, or let's try that. We were very concrete. So the systems-based tools part of it are all the tools that are used in identifying and resolving the, the, the problems. And this is a method that I've proven since 2006 with every business that I've consulted with or managed with honestly 100% success. It just, because what happens is all your frontline people can see what's happening and they become engaged. And so it's like engage, 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 engage. And it takes so much burden off of the, the top leader, the owner. Um, you know, you've got now veterinarians, they come out of school. Most of them don't know how to manage and they're starting a practice and they're, my God, they're working, you know, 60, 70 hours a week and trying to find time to manage. That, that's a problem that happens, you know, throughout not just veterinary medicine. So this is, this is a lifetime way for a business or a practice to handle organizational management, basically, if you want to put a, a label on it. So using the two in combination, it's, it's, a, it's, not, it's very uh, structured, but what my program is, is um, because I don't want to travel a lot anymore, I will go out for up to a week at a time now with COVID over, but really what I'm looking for is I've created this to be an eight week virtual training. And I work with top line level leaders and their staff up to about four or five people for eight weeks in very intense sessions where I'm facilitating the process. So we're identifying actual issues, coming up with resolutions, showing them how to use the whole program so that when they leave at the eight weeks, they, they're gonna have ongoing support from me, obviously, if needed or wanted, but they've got a method to use that is ongoing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's um, honestly, it just, like I said, um, it rocked my world when I, when, I, when I discovered this. And I discovered it um, when I was working with a hospital in a medical practice. And that's kind of a fun story too. I don't know if we have time for it, but it's fun how I discovered it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I am curious about that because I know, I think people are probably fairly familiar with the Four Agreements and the, that book. But then I think you're talking about maybe Six Sigma when they're looking at Japanese manufacturing and really breaking down to the front line where the faults are, what, what the hiccups are, what's the slowdown. And um, even to the point where uh, like, uh, well, I think some of it has actually caused some problems with COVID in COVID times because it was always on demand uh, for parts because it was very efficient. And they all, and then we they couldn't get parts, and and because everything got crazy, and then we couldn't get any cars, and so there's there's uh, uh, some negative things that happened because of becoming extremely efficient, uh, probably overly efficient. I think there's a fine line between being uh, efficient and so efficient that 
you become robotic. Yeah. yeah, so we don't want to do that. that that's where the servant leader, you see, that's where the right. conscious leadership comes in because it's always, honestly, it's always people first. Mm -hmm. you know, people first, and you're, you're using that model. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's also a, the growth of a leader. I mean, we meet people where they are. And so not every leader is you know, sometimes that's a foreign language to them. Mm -hmm. So my job, and, and as you know, it, it's yours as well, is to meet people where they are and to use my training, my experience, my wisdom to help them shift. But they've got to want to shift. So I don't work with anybody unless they really are honest about acknowledging what's going on, what's wrong, and that they have a seer, sincere desire to fix it. Because, you know, we just, we don't have time for that anymore. You know, I'm, I'm here to serve. And um, I've paid my dues, and I've proven the system. And so I, I just want to share it. You know, I just, I want I want to pass it on. So it, I want to pay it forward and it can be paid forward and paid forward and paid for. Yeah. So, yeah. So how I found it, um, did you want me to answer that? Yes, I do. Oh, yeah. Great. It was really cool. So um, I was working uh, for, uh, I had been hired to help set up an OBGYN practice in Northern New Mexico. Um, very uh, kind of a, 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 not a wealthy community, but a very diverse community. And um, the hospital hired me and uh, the, there were um, a husband and wife uh, OBGYN partnership and then they had a, a GP partner. And so, um, so I went in and they, I think they like been there just three weeks. And so I got to really you know, kind of help them start up the practice and we, we got moved into a new building and I got to use my background in design and all that other stuff, which I wouldn't even talk about, but to, you know, to do the colors and stuff in the building. And one of the, we had a locum OBGYN that came in um, and helped us out and worked with this. And then he ended up moving and taking a position with um, a regional medical center down in, in uh, Southern um, New Mexico. And I don't know, remember how much time went by, but several months went by and he came to visit along with a couple of his nurses, came to visit the hospital and then he came over to the practice and we were all sitting down in the, in the lunchroom and you know, chatting and, and talking to one another. And all of a sudden one of the uh, nurses looked at me and she said, do you know about the four agreements? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I mean, because I had studied it for years, right? Mm -hmm. So I, so I said, well, yeah. I said, why do you ask? She said, well, we have a consultant working with us down at the hospital that works with the four agreements and is and works with systems and is helping us to figure out what's wrong and how to fix things and work as teams. And uh, I said wow, I said, I need to meet this man. So of course, I think it was probably either that day or the next day I, I um, contacted him and I said, you know, I'd love to come over and meet you and see what you're doing. Would that be okay when you're over there next? Because he lived in Southern California. And uh, he said, certainly. So I got hold of the CEO at the hospital to get permission because, um, you know, there was going to be confidential stuff being discussed. So I ended up going down I, maybe a couple of weeks later when he flew over and he would come over and stay for a week and work with them. And I ended up going down and spent two days there, met him, just adored him, um, spent time, you know, with the teams and in the hospital watching what they were doing. And he said, well, listen, he said, I'm about to start my first course with a group of people in a new agreement certification training. Um, I said, okay, I'm in. <laughs> so by the end of 2005, uh, I, after traveling there and doing the homework and studying and going once a month for six months, I was certified in. And then of course, I was using it in the medical practice. Mm -hmm. And I continued to do that and build it and work it for the next three and a half, four years, which is when I got to leave and go to Southern California and implement it there in, in the practices that 
that we were working with, we had one, we, they were merging two practices. I had to merge four, I think. Two of the practices we were merging uh, had been trying for over a year to merge these two practices. I was able to pull together a transition team from both practices, get the job done, and in three months, we were merged and into one building. The, the veterinarians were happy. It, because we had just, as a team, we had just identified all of the different things that needed to happen. And of course, we had, you know, support from, from the region and the corporate, you know, for things like building things that needed to happen and equipment, stuff like that. So, uh, but it was just, it was just a great experience. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Is I've, I've always believed that people come into your life for a reason, right? There's so these these random acts or the random people, just like you and I just, I mean, it was LinkedIn. Uh, we just started to talk to each other and we've been connected ever since. So tell me merely about, um, about networking, about how networking has played a role for you in your career development and the different things that have happened in life. Well, I would have to say probably not as much as it could have, okay? Because I get very focused on what I'm doing and <laughs> I don't know how to say this. You know, I have a marketing, branding marketing agency on the side, right? But I really don't like that marketing part of it. So I have, you know, Google partners that do that, right? Um, I'm really an introvert. And so, I did a lot of networking as a young woman, particularly um, when I was building an escrow company. I did a lot of networking. I did a lot of networking when I was with the veterinarian um, in, in Washington because that was, you know, part of building it. Mm -hmm. So I tend to, for myself, I tend to stay back and I wish I could do it as good as you did. <laughs> That's all I can say. So here I am now, I'm going, having really having to go back in <laughs> to LinkedIn and really connect. So that's my next step. Mm -hmm. So I would have to say that I'm not very good at networking because it's not my favorite thing because I, I tend to like to kind of stay in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I think people sometimes have a, an impression of networking is that you're always like pushing yourself onto people and and glad handing. And it's like one of those B and I groups where you go and you have to bring so many people and you have to pass out so many business cards. But I've never looked at it like that. I because people to me are always fascinating. And I just like to help people. So if I can know something about them and then I can say, hey, you know what? I can put you with this person that I know, and the two of you can do something wonderful together, or you can help each other, or you have compatibility in what your work is, then that just makes me happy. I just like to, I, I think I'm a matchmaker at heart, but like a, a business matchmaker, not a romantic matchmaker. And so I like to put people together that I think can help each other. And I don't expect to get anything out of it except a sense of satisfaction because it did it. And that makes me happy. But, but you, when you describe it that way, Debbie, I love to do that. See? I do that all the time. Yeah. You know, I'm always, if I'm researching and I find something, I'm always going, oh, this would be perfect for this person. And I send them the email and I say, mm -hmm. do this. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Mm -hmm. And so I guess when we're looking at it and talking about the word networking, it's really service. It's mm -hmm. service. And so it's just another term for, for how we do it. And that I get. Right. So, so the other, the way I was looking at it before was, you know, going to all the groups and schmoozing and being social, mm -hmm. you know, and I did all that as a young woman. And that was, and you know what, truly, when I was showing dogs and horses and stuff, it was easy then, because, you know, you're just out there talking about what you love, you know, you're exactly. not having, don't feel yeah. like you have to sell. I don't want to sell anything. Right. I just right. want to serve. Right. Well, and, and that's why I think good networking is really just about reaching out to other people and seeing how you can help them. And then I think, you know, the universe makes things happen for you. you know, like okay. you know, re reciprocity <laughs> comes around and, 
And I know I, I, we want to, I want to talk to you particularly about um, spirituality, because I know that you, you actually created a whole line of, of clothing and design and, and things for some uh, uh, church. But I want to talk about kind of how you, you see the universe, how you see things like miracles happening. And you, you actually said earlier today, I have, I had this call and it was, it's a miracle. It's like the first miracle. So if, uh, just looking for uh, miracles in every day. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I just have to say that from the time I was nine years old, I was searching for God, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. I mean, I, I didn't know. Um, and I'd had, maybe it was because I had a lot of trauma as a young child. Um, my father died when, when I was quite young. And then there were some things that were, we don't want to talk about in the, in, that went on in the family. My mother was pretty unstable at that time. So I was, you know, I was looking for something, you know, even as a kid, as, as, as children that are under stress and abused and emotionally, physically, whatever, they, they have a huge need. And so uh, it was about, I remember about nine years old, and we had just moved to this, from the San Francisco area to this beautiful little town in Northern California, which is, oh, my happiest years were there. But um, my mother was uh, wanted, was going to the Christian Science Church, but I wanted to go to the Catholic Church because I, my neighbors were Catholic, most of the people in town were Catholic, but I also just loved walking in that church. So my mother said, okay, well, you can go to the Catholic Church if you, if, but you have to come to Christian Science Sunday School. So I was nine years old and I was going to the Catholic, Catholic Mass and then I go to the Christian Science, about, you know, this far apart, right? So um, yeah, it just, it kind of always hung with me and, and um. I, I had a really joyful time living there for about three or four years. My mother had remarried and that's my daddy that I lost last year, who was, he was my best friend. He was just the most wonderful, you know, I was so fortunate in him. Both my sister and I were fortunate in, in my dad. Um, and then even through high school, um, you know, I was active and I was social, but I, um, I was, you know, continued that spiritual search and with some organizations that I was in and participated in. It never, it never really left. Um, then I kind of, you know, went to college and, and got married and had a couple of children. And I think it was right after maybe my youngest son was born, I started back searching again in, in, at various religions. I looked at a number of them. I, I won't even mention them, but I looked at a number of them. I studied with them. And, um, and then I, 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 you know, I looked, then I thought I wanted to branch even further. So I started reading and, uh, you know, uh, about Judaism and history and, um, and Buddhism. And just, I, I guess maybe I've always had that, that universal, um, somehow a universal understanding. I call it now the universal Christ. Um, and so for me, that's, that's kind of evolved. And, um, you know, in, uh, when started going to ministerial school in, uh, I think it was, I don't know, 1982. Um, I actually am an ordained minister, although I don't practice. Um, I practice in my life and my heart. Um, and I have, after, I, I, I left that in 19, 1990, I walked away because I said, I don't have anything to tell people anymore. I need to go live it. You know, I need to go walk the walk. And so that began that, that journey with my former partner of 16 years that went completely sideways. You know, it was like, okay, I guess I had something to learn from that because it sure took me a hell of a long time to get the message, right? But during that time, I didn't, I wasn't really studying. I kind of walked away from everything and just lived life. You know, I was trying to survive. And um, it wasn't until 
three and a half years ago that I realized that I absolutely had to come back into community and find community and spiritual community. And I did, maybe it was four years ago. So I started, um, my heart still was, had a lot of the Catholicism and the love for the sacredness and, and the ritual. So I kind of started looking for a progressive Catholic church. And I, I happened upon, upon Father Richard Rohr, who's very, very well known. Um, and his, his message is in, extremely um, universal. Um, and so he really struck my heart. So I started to, to read some of the, the old mystics and um, yeah, I did a lot of personal study. And yeah, and so about three and a half years ago, I found a progressive Christian church here in Albuquerque and I just fell in love with them. Um, love my pastor and this past year I served as the head of the church board in fact Sunday was my last day so I'm taking a big deep breath because the COVID year was really rough but community whatever it is finding a community of people that whose purpose is really to grow to love to respect to serve their community and whatever you know their heart desires whether it's working with immigration or people on the border or justice it doesn't matter or you know feeding the hungry we do all that but whatever that is you know it's follow your heart you know it's dig deep and follow your heart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think well, people girl pants when the bump hit. <laughs> yeah that's right that's it exactly right um, well, Marilee, we're going to put all your information in the show notes about how to get in touch with uh, you and about your uh, courses and uh, the connections and the links. But how about a fun fact? Any, do you have any special talents or anything uh, secret talent that you would like to shine a light on here and surprise people that they might not know that you do that? <laughs> a secret talent? Yeah. Well, I used to sing a lot. I don't sing so much anymore, but actually I'm going to back and join the choir. Uh, I've gone from a first soprano to an alto uh, as I've aged. But here's a secret that probably nobody except my closest friends know about me. And that is the way that I relax and kind of zone out on all kinds of things is I love a great crime novel and a mystery. <laughs> and I'm a huge fan of, of political dramas and crime dramas, particularly the European ones. I'm, I'm crazy about the French or the Danish or the Swedish. I think they do it the best. So you know, what can I say? You know, like going from the great, you know, spiritual studies and the deep stuff and the mysteries to to the crime dramas, but you know, they, there, there's always a twist there. So yeah. Who is, the, is it uh, John, Le, John Le Care? Is that one of the, Oh yeah. I love yeah. his stuff. Yeah. Yes. Well, so, you know, I don't watch sports. So, you know, you guys that watch sports and zone out in sports, I just, you know, I just watch a good, a good series of, uh, you know, shoot them up stuff. And, <laughs> but, you know, it's really interesting. I, I I've kind of, when I do that, I kind of like to sit back and see, well, what did, what did I learn about that? I just finished watching a whole series on um, on Netflix, which was really centered around the 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 huge uh, conflict between um, the Jews and the Palestinians, and it was um, you know it was a shoot 'em up thing, but it was so much more than that. You know, it was families on both sides and the horrible price it's paid when we keep just looking for revenge 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 it's just you know so there, there's always something to learn from that mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. I suppose there's something to learn from sports too you know yeah well I have a couple of friends my godson was a quarterback for the high school football team and then in college and I think that the team that team mentality is something that you can learn from sports definitely and I have a good friend who was a high school and college football coach. And he really, well, too, actually, that, and they feel like part of their job is actually growing young men. Absolutely. And, and women. Mm -hmm, yeah, but they, they were male coaches. Yeah. They, they taught, taught uh, football. So 
there is there is that you're right and I think we learn from everything I love history I've always been a student of history and I'm a firm believer that if we don't study history we are doomed to repeat it and I fear greatly that we are Rome and if we don't pay attention we are going to fall like Rome did so we need to start paying attention to the past to say that we can correct it and not repeat it in the future um any final words of wisdom or anything that you particularly want to tell us about your business or your company or are you still doing graphic design or are you going to focus more on the agreements um well i'm gonna that's my focus but um if i have a graphic design client that comes along that i really you know yeah the branding yeah absolutely okay. um that's you know it's it, you mentioned the 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 shop that i created with the clothing lines with you know spiritual sayings on them um that was um that's a very healing thing for me and actually what i found is if i can take a day of my weekend and just you know design clothes and design uh, bedding and things like that i'm in the process of kind of going around the world right now with that and so what i'm looking at is um I have a whole collection of um, bedding that's based on, um, you know, African, traditional African designs, and I'm going into Oceania now. And so that's giving, that just takes me away. You know, it kind of like I get immersed in that. It's like working with a dog or a horse. When you're training a dog, working with an animal, you're completely present. And so that is helpful. So all I really want to say, I think, in closing, Deb, is Honestly, it, it's if I have any advice for any of you, it is to dig deep, define what your passion and your dream is, and don't give up. No matter how hard it looks, figure out the steps that you need to take and begin and just follow your dream. Don't work in anything or do anything that you don't love to do because it's a waste of your life and your life is precious. 100% mm -hmm. agree with you. Life is short. And you know, you and I, we are looking back over years of time and, and that old saying that says nobody ever wished that they'd spent more time at work when they're laying on their deathbed. Um, and that's not to say that you don't enjoy your work, but, but if you, are miserable every day, you can get out. There is no, and especially right now, I mean, in veterinary medicine, everybody's trying to hire. So there's opportunity, but I think everybody's trying to hire everywhere. And I think that there's a, a lot of reinvention going on right now because people found out that they don't have to do it like they've always done it. So I'm, I'm going to see a lot of new technologies, I think, that are going to come out and take some of the kind of mundane task off of our plates and free us up to do more thinking task. And those are kind of the fun things to do because you're right. You don't spend time doing stuff that you're miserable at, but don't be bored either no. be because that's the other thing too, is I think sometimes we just get really comfortable at work. Everything's great. And I mean, I worked my first veterinary job for 19 years and I absolutely loved it still to stay in touch with some of the staff members today um actually I had a two-hour call yesterday with somebody that I worked with there for so long but when I left there I figured out I was bored because it had become very easy to do and it was not challenging to me so um there's always a challenge ahead make sure you're constantly challenging yourself otherwise you just stagnate and you don't live your best life. Yeah, you're, I, I absolutely agree. And I guess, you know, along that same line, if you are in whatever work you're doing, um, you know, whether it's veterinary, medical, whatever, if you're doing the work and you know that it's work you love, but you're so stressed out for all different kinds of other reasons, whether it's financial, whether you're just working too hard, too many hours, you're not getting there's not, there's not a flow of energy or equal value, then uh, again, this is a pitch for my company, but the new agreements in the workplace is a system that will help you get out of that pain. It's all about heaven or hell. So if you're in hell, 
choose heaven. We'll help you get there. <laughs> and, you know, and, and whatever that is, it mm-hmm. may be like my, my first veterinarian I worked with who knew that her heaven was out in the field training field dogs and not in the veterinary practice. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. That's okay too. But if you're in pain, let's get out of it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Mary Lee, like I said, we're going to put all your information in the show notes so people will be able to get in touch with you and links to your website. And I want to thank you for being on the program. And I know your time is is precious and valuable and you have other things to do. So thank you for that and and for the just being a friend because we certainly enjoyed knowing each other over the years. And and I, I will say this. For those of you who see interesting people on LinkedIn, buy the bullet, go ahead, introduce yourself and pick up the phone and make a call. And I I have met so many wonderful people that way and just opportunities show up. Um, Don't be afraid to reach out to somebody if you find them fascinating and interesting because chances are true that they are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, my love. You're welcome so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.